You okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Me? Yep, sound good. Okay, good. It is recording. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so I have a few things on mind to to talk about. I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly where we left off. Um, I did watch uh, that video you sent me with um, uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Sorry, um, if we've said that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah sorry. Um, uh, yeah, that, that, that was a cool conversation. Um, I mean, I, I think I think we we're probably going to talk about this already, but yeah, maybe just uh, thinking about um, how to talk about the culture question. I don't know. I, I'd be interested yeah. in doing that. Yeah, uh, so, uh, let me I'll, I'll tell you where I'm definitely emphasizing my thinking, and I think that might help clarify okay yeah so i you know the more i encounter all these various different worldviews, you know the more it's necessary to contextualize um things to have them be properly situated okay uh, and i did definitely realize i need to be i mean i've known this for a while but i need to be particularly careful um about it to be clear about the theory of knowledge that i'm advocating for you know yeah i am not uh, it's easy to come across that I'm advocating for some foundationalist truth claims because it's this unbelievably big system and it drains right. everybody in. Right. That's not really what I'm advocating for um, at all. Um, what I am advocating for is is what I am basically saying is I think I found a very important missing piece. Yeah. The knowledge systems. Okay. Yeah. And and if you don't have this piece accounted for, chances are your knowledge systems are going to be incomplete. And that's right. totally true of sort of the Western canon and tradition and ideological set, which is going to include science. And so therefore, it's going to include a lot of shit. Um, yeah. So, but here's the point that I was going to make is that actually my lineage in American psychology is really important okay? right. um, because it creates a particular kind of angle on enlightenment knowledge. It creates a particular kind of angle on the relationship between natural sciences and social sciences. It creates a particular emphasis on uh, epistemological and ontological problems that my discipline uh, and its location and socio-historical justification space uh, got tangled up with, got uh, blinded by, and then becomes emphasized in, in a specific position that may not be as emphasized or certainly as central if you're operating in a different context okay um so really in, in fact i'm debating whether to write in my forward to this book that i'm writing it's called the problem of psychology and its solution is really it's, it is important to contextualize this in american psychology yeah and it's got lots of different um you know angles so that's going to then imply like when i was talking about sociology from an indian perspective i mean we didn't yeah. talk too much about it from an indian perspective but um the way you carve up nature uh, is going to depend a lot on what your primary concerns are, what you see the problems are, and you'll be situated right. in that regard. And I right. want to make every, everybody aware that I'm situated in a particular space uh, yeah. of, of and, and, and concerned with a particular set of problems that have far reaching implications, but not everyone needs to necessarily be centered in the same kind of thing. So I'll, I'll say that and see what, uh, what happens yeah. to you in, by, when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. So, sorry, I'm just going to click something off here. Right, right here. Um, yeah. Um, I think, um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, there's always that, you know, you're, you're, you're already, you're a systematizer and an integrator of, of thinking, and there's always that horizon of, um is there some banging going on in the back there? yeah sorry it's just my heater <laughs> oh okay yeah. well it is what it'll, it is That's it'll what go it. off and just, <laughs> there's no uh yeah yeah i apologize sure it's fine go ahead um is it loud should i should i wait or uh, it's just a, a slight background noise, so okay, if, if it's doing what it's doing, whatever, we can definitely hear. All right, let's work through it. Um, um, yeah, that there's always this uh, horizon of, of trying to incorporate 
everything, right? And and all of us or anyone that tries to do that thing, there's always it's always going to escape you. But at the same time, um, yeah, it's just a matter of exactly like you talk about uh, sort of once you start to hook up your uh, your systematizing project with other projects, then they can kind of try to get at that hole. And it's interesting. I wonder how you would what word you would even give to what that hole would be, you know, because if you kind of say, you know, I'm just sort of focusing mainly on psychology, whether it's American psychology or, or just Euro American psychology or, or whatever it is, what's, and you start adding sociology and biology and, and different, I don't know, like, where would you see the, the end point being of, of the collective effort of the largest, yeah. what, what would you even call it? A, a of, because even the TOK knowledge, like, uh, you know, sometimes there's that s still, I still hear from me, I still hear from you that sense of uh, the synthesis of all knowledge yeah. or whatever, yeah. you know? So. No, so, so that's a great question. Um, what I'm really trying uh, to do, I would say, is I'm trying to lead a path toward an in second enlightenment. Basically, open the door for that, uh, whereby the the enlightenment started a new way of thinking about knowledge. Okay, yeah. uh, and I want to sort of complete that project, not in any finalized way, but by arguing that fundamentally it was obviously incomplete. Yeah. Okay. What do we mean by complete? An adequate synthetic philosophy. That's what yeah. I'm basically after. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'm a coherentist. A coherentist are these systematizers, yeah. right? Uh, and then the issue is, do you have an adequate system, synthetic philosophy? And somebody like Hegel is a great example. Somebody really tried, and for whatever, 70 years, there was a real, in German thought, they really thought that they had a particular frame. And, yeah. and I'm not a Hegel expert, mm -hmm. although obviously it didn't last. Uh, and I know enough about Hegel to know my critique. I would then say that I'm situated really in what I would, this gets into the American psychology position, is that more than ever, I'm like, and somebody told me, it's like, oh, Henricus, you're between Kant and uh, Newton. Mm. And, I, and I was like, yes, actually, that is my lineage, okay? Yeah. And what happens with Newton is the awareness of this sort of objectivist matter in motion potential, okay? that then ultimately gives rise to, in its most extreme and bastardized form, a physicalist reductionism, okay? right? Right. It's just sort of like, oh, it really is just matter in motion and the mathematical mapping, and that's all we can say about what reality is. And, you know, I'm highly critical of that as any type of complete, because it doesn't include the knowledge that you have of that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it yeah. tries to factor out the knower. Um, so that's a big fucking problem. Uh, and then on the other side, or related to that, you have the Kantian argument of that tries to synthesize uh, experiential empiricism and rationalism into a right. phenomenological category of mind. Right. Okay? Uh, and so you get basically modern philosophy with a Kantian, oh my God, we have categories of mind that we're imputing phenomenologically on to the matter in motion. And he offers some way to make sense out of that. Yeah. Obviously, he doesn't have a synthetic psychology. I mean, his transcendent psychological work or whatever. There's no, there's no fundamental frame to put together matter and motion behavior and human phenomenology, basically. Right, right, okay? right. And my right. disciplines is a great evidence that there wasn't <laughs> in right. all of the various right. branches and brokenness uh, yeah. that's trying to jam together scientific matter and motion behavior at some level with human phenomenology in some coherent science, you know, it was so bastardized and broken that the consensus was to attempt that synthesis is wrong. I mean, it's just, there's right. just no way. Okay. So then I fall into that vortex and it's a, in the vortex that I fall into as both a natural scientist, appreciation for social science and understanding science as a particular kind of transcendent knowledge system, although we can talk about that and then wanting to be a therapist, okay, turned out to be a very, very interesting void that I fell into that's coming off the enlightenment gap. It's a very, very right. powerful void um, that connects me to the natural sciences, physics and biology, connects yeah. me to the social sciences above, anthropology, yeah. sociology, and connects right. me to the applied professional engineering sciences like medicine, or in my case, being a psychological doctor. 
Yeah. Yeah. Those are huge uh, domains, and they're at the epicenter of the Kantian and Newtonian confusion, you know, that certainly then comes off of whether there's a German idealism that helps with Hegel and you go off. Yeah. And I got good philosophical friends like Alexander Bard, who's like, well, Henry Castile, he'll always say, you know, that's your problem because <laughs> I got yeah. trapped into a whole, but there damn well is a problem between Kant and Newton and consilience in, yeah. in the science of psychology. Yeah. So then, so now what am I basically saying? I'm like, well, I'm anchored into the center of American psychology, okay? Mm -hmm. That cannot have consilience between basic behavioral animal psychology and right. human psychology and psychotherapy. Okay? So right. that nexus is all effed up. I can look at what E.O. Wilson tried to do and E.O. E. Wilson in consilience and he comes out and he's like, hey, there's the Ionian enchantment that those of us that are big picture systematizers want consilient synthetic yeah. philosophy that actually makes sense at the edges. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so he then from a natural science physicist into biologist into unbelievably educated, you know, modernist thinkers like, hey, there is a unity of knowledge view called consilience. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that gets attention. Uh, and you see a very similar parallel process in big history. So Dave Christian's big history and consilience I see are the modernist kinds of attempts to, uh, or, you know, updated modern modernist attempts to try to say, yes, there is a big synthetic vision of science that's very important philosophically and humanistically and has coherence. So consilience and big history are two exemplars of that. Okay? Yeah, yeah. But my critique of both of them is, listen, guys, I'm over here as a psychologist. You need to know to go to physics, to biology. You got to get through psychology to the social sciences, to the humanities. Yeah. Yeah. And neither one of you, Dave Christian, a historian, or uh, E.O. Wilson, uh, an entomologist, is, knows what the hell they're talking about. They don't, even, they don't even know that there's a problem, or at least acknowledge deeply, that you can't get there from here. Right. Right. Um, and so that's my flag waving is, yeah, brothers, <laughs> there's yeah. a real problem in this nexus. If we solve this nexus, then the opportunity for large scale consilience comes online. Right. Okay? Yep. Yep. But, and then we still have huge problems. Like I actually have to get to anthropology. <laughs> I got to right. get to sociology and deal with all that. And then, of course, there's other huge problems like quantum mechanics and general relativity. We need those guys to figure out what the hell's going on at the bottom of this thing, you know? Um, right. And so, so it's the unified theory of knowledge is the outline of a consilience that solves one of the most obvious and central problems that stem off the enlightenment that I call the enlightenment yeah. gap. Like what's yeah. matter in mind? What's yeah. science in society? TOK mm -hmm. in the entire UK, unified theory of knowledge is like, nope, I can totally upgrade just the basic metaphysics of describing our terms and now have much more consilience in relation. Okay. Totally. And now totally. it's like, well, once we have that, then other people can build off of that and be like, well, what's the hell the implications for anthropology, sociology, mm -hmm. the humanities, the quantum mechanics and general relativity and, and yeah. everything in between. Uh, yeah. and that, but at the point of it is, is, is that the, the po another way of saying this is that the postmodern critique that there is no grand meta narrative, at least at, there's a loose way to say, yeah, there actually is, <laughs> you know, we, yeah. just, we didn't have it. So I'll yeah, totally. No, there. totally. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. Many, many things there. Um, I'll kind of uh, bounce between them. Um, yeah. The first thing about um, wanting to finish the enlightenment project, I, I really resonate with, because I think that's sort of how I figure how I, how I see what I, what I've been working on. Um, but also trying to um, uh, position or, I don't know, f uh, understand that enlightenment moment, wh whatever part of the European enlightenment we're talking about, sort of within that larger history of what I've, I don't know what to call other than humanism, mm -hmm. which is just, and in some ways in kind of breaking those things apart, it's almost kind of like explaining, well, if we, are attached to the word enlightenment, then you can kind of think about like even the Italian Renaissance totally. and different pre-moments as sort of also enlightenment moments, or you can flip it and say, well, the enlightenment's really a humanist moment among many humanist moments, or, you know? And so, um, because it's, you know, it's about the organization of all science and the integration of science with art and integration with that and a religious project 
and all of these different things. And, and so that's, that's one thing to get, kind I, of get into. I, I, yeah, actually, let's pause on that for just a second. Please. I think yeah. that's beautiful. Um, and I really do see this as a transformation. So there's, and this is the Western lineage. I think we have to be very clear. Right. I read it. I, I like, did, have you read Richard Tarnas's The a Passion of the Western Mind? I haven't. I haven't. Great. I strongly recommend it. I had it circled out a number. My friend Greg Thomas, like, you got to actually read that. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, so I'll, I'll recommend and, and read it. And it's solidified um, uh, this intellectual history, the history of ideas. And it's interesting that he, he uses the term mind because I'll be like, actually, yeah, the cultural mind three, not yeah. our like perceiving mind. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But anyway, the, so he really delineates our history. And, you know, from the Greeks, especially Socrates, Plato, uh, right. Aristotle, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get the Roman establishment, and then you get the Roman Catholic Christian establishment. Yeah. Okay? And then Rome collapses, and then what happens in, you know, as it spreads out over, you know, Europe, Eastern, Western, you right. then get a thousand years of mm -hmm. some variant of Greco Roman thought dominated mm -hmm. out of Christian metaphysics that really, yeah. you know, just, just for a thousand years, <laughs> it yeah. basically is what everybody is in this domain. Yeah. And then it, for you know the bubonic plague happens and other things you know whatever or the forces but then you get a humanistic awakening yeah definitely i mean martin luther's plays a role in this but the renaissance okay at the level of sort of what people so the emergence of the human potential and the and the and the desire for a birth that appreciates right. human potential and human understanding is clearly a renaissance enlightenment right that growth off of you know the 14th yeah. to 15th centuries it's definitely there's an enlightenment and, and I mean right. a renaissance into enlightenment mm -hmm. humanism yeah okay, that I want to say hey yes and in fact it creates modernity I mean that's right. really yeah. all of that uh and both the po beautiful potential of humans and their human hubris <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the yeah. monster of the technological genie that we let out of the bottle mm -hmm. all of that is really rooted in this 400 year you know explosion period yeah yeah. right uh and and part of the meta modern or enlightenment 2.0 version of reality is, mm -hmm. is this sort of like we need to take a position in relationship to this human explosion in a particular kind of way because it's like yeah. now it's now reached its potential and now it's kind yeah. of ugly in some ways yeah <laughs> yeah yeah the stakes are maybe a little higher but well, it's, yeah, it's, no. it's always hard yeah of course um yeah and uh so yeah and it's also important like um you know so you, you know to also the attempt is to, to try to not only synthesize all those major moments so like um if i mean because that's the thing is like the whole history of literature if if you're if you're reading it with a philosophical center point or something um then is really just the history of the creation and then rediscovery of the platonic vision in a way and then you can add aristotle and attach to that but like for example the neoplatonists you know that was a moment what six uh, 600 or whatever years after th that moment but they synthesized all philosophy you know the stoic yep. philosophy and aristotelian philosophy and and many other things you know uh, persian uh persian philosophy and different sort of poetic philosophies into a single um moment and then and then another moment that i'm really interested in is like the islamic golden age with especially mm. avicenna and what he does where he actually it, that's really the moment where it really disrupts um the concept of the western tradition you can still maintain that in a way but because him and him and a lot of his uh talk to me about uh, him I'm, I'm actually i need some education I don't know. I don't know a, a ton. I haven't gotten into it, but I mean, my sense is that he's, I, I don't have enough uh, knowledge to say okay. this with too much confidence, but I'm going to kind of, I'll say it anyways. All right. <laughs> Great. Um, that was easy. Um, and uh, I see him as like for, for that time period, which was like in the like 1200 or something. Okay um uh that's you know the islamic world is economically just more sophisticated than than western europe at that time right. and really that's the the highest that they have like a basically uh, an islamic uh humanist 
uh, mm. revival because they get all these accesses to all the old Greek texts right. um, and all the Neoplatonic texts. Mm. But then he also, you know, him like, uh, I think it's uh, Albruni or something like that. Um, uh, a teacher of him or a friend of him that's also is going to India instead and in taking the Indian philosophy. So then they start to fuse basically basic uh, Islamic theological ideas, but then compacted with a whole history of um, Aristotelian, Platonic, Neoplatonic philosophy. So uh, Avicenna, to me, in, in his works, really, he's, he synthesizes all the history of philosophy that he has ac access to at that time. And that very sophisticated form of a full, he goes from metaphysics to practical philosophy, to politics, to being the first person to really give the actual philosophical foundation for medicine as a practice, right? And which is all based in Aristotelian physics. And so he then is the major person among a few other uh, thinkers that then uh, is sort of like the stepping stool for um, the, uh, like the moment of Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas because they were studying them and so right. they do the same thing, bring this new rich physical uh, science plus this like Neoplatonic metaphysics. And then that lays the foundation for a couple hundred years later, the Renaissance humanists, you know, sort of right. build off of that scholastic right. synthesis. Beautiful. And then, but then, the, but I'll just yeah. pause there for a second. It just tells you why as an individual human, I'm, you're just an idiot. I mean, I just, right. you know, just yeah. I, I, all the time, you know, my little, you know, just the amount we don't know, you know, so yeah. like, I'm doing my best to try to, you know, and I know a little bit, you know, oh, but yeah, it's just then you're like, oh my God, you know, it's like, there's this whole renaissance, Greg, that you're, yeah. you're managing Western thought. You're like, well, what about this? You know, you're like, I don't, I, yeah. it's just sort of like, whatever. No, I'm that, often that's, humbled that's that always way. my experience as well. <laughs> yeah, we need a, we need, we need each other, definitely. Need each other. Um, you know, and, and so there's a much, so that's an interesting thing. And then it kind of, kind of goes back. Um, uh, be, it depends where you're looking, I guess. Um, but then there's, uh, you know, cause then the, then the usually most major moments of literary and philosophical production happen in some capital of the empire of that day. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, whether it's in, I don't know if it was in, Baghdad, or I'm not sure where um, Avicenna was, or uh, there's probably a few different places, but um, but especially when you get back to uh, Europe uh, and Florence, right, the Medici's, uh, then eventually that Renaissance moves to the Netherlands that become the power, and then eventually Germany, you know, when Germany has its big moment, it's kind of coming into its own as being a, a, a world force or whatever. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, for me, there's still like that attempt to continue to s try to synthesize and bring in traditions that I'm less, yeah, much less familiar with than like a Platonic or Greek based mm -hmm. systems for so like Vedanta philosophy, especially in a lot of different Hindu traditions, and then a lot of Buddhist philosophy, that's kind of part of the task, like, he, especially right. in psychology, because that's really what they're doing is like, and a lot of these classic, uh, you know, Madhyamaka Buddhism and sure. uh, and different writers, like what they're doing is awfully similar to some sort of, you know, uh, phenomenological psychology totally. and, and, and whatever. So um, anyways, but let's 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 talk about historical things maybe later, because I think we, yeah. it would be fun to talk about uh, to try to chew on the culture question. Um, and I and I. Um, yeah, I. Um, yeah, so let's see, where, where can we start? Because this is, and first I'll say this is, even though I think maybe you uh, you say you haven't uh, studied that much sociology or, or anthropology, uh, being someone that I feel like myself has really tried to focus on the social slash cultural question of things, I think you've already kind of done it, you know? And so this is, in, in a way, not, and you know, not it's not never finished for any of us right sure. but um my point is like i think the basics of what i've just worked on like i already at least hear a lot of it from you you know and, and in a ways i would describe what you're doing as um anthropology especially when you get into things like the development of um basically the description of the full range of human activities 
in the scope of like uh, an evolutionary analysis of what pre-humans do. And especially when you get into your philosophy of language, already that's fundamental anthropology in a way. I guess that's slightly different than uh, uh, sociology, but it's, 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 it's close. Anyway, so, but let me, so how I try to, um, I think the first thing that may be interesting to you is that I've theorized um, the culture question okay. and the social question or societal question as a unity. And this is very confusing because generally one, there's the sense of sociology is over here and ethnology is over here. But my argument is that as if like sociology is like the physical or like just the general interaction of the group and then culture is somehow like the flowery stuff on top which is just like the ideas. I try to say, no, we have to first, once you build the sort of pre-sociocultural principles as you have, which are to show the relationship between mind and body. So there's the mind dimension, you have to kind of account for that. Then the, the mind which begets the practical or behavioral element. And then you have the object of what uh, the animal relates to. Then within the, the conceptualization of what um, the group is, I kind of use culture as not just the ideas of a group, yep. but the it's it's just the plural version of uh what i call the the ethos or the character the ego of yeah. which is like kind of like on one hand the total activity or action behavior of the individual or organism yep um but also kind of like the structure that maintains memory and that yep. um is 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 more applicable to the the idea of uh, ethos as the sort of substrate of habitus yes. of uh that maintains identity that create is this created identity through experience and then constantly uh shapes uh experience so when i experience something this experience is going to shape my character yep as i'm having the experience the character structure shapes how i yep. perceive and act right and so culture, and this is, and I try to blend this with like essentially a Hegelian and a Herdurian lineage of thinking about the essence of culture okay. or the folk or Geist yep. and different, gotcha. or the folk okay. Geist. Folk Geist. Um, uh -huh. And which is that it's, um, it's like this, um, it, it, it relates to two things because I, I would say like it, um, how do I how do I go through this? Um, that it's it's really just trying to describe the fun, fundamental dynamic of two of multiple embodied souls or psyches coming into a, a relationship to one another, yeah. but in one that's fundament uh, importantly distinct from the relationship that is the most primordial forms of relationship that an animal would have or an organism would have which is Good. the first things you relate to are, are the body itself the physical environment the physicality of, of, of things and then you have certain things that the mind is pre-given to desire and go after right so food uh, mates or whatever right but then there's a point when that object of interaction is now something just like you and parallel to you and the story of of uh, of the development of quasi sociality to full socia sociality to the sort of end game of sociality is just higher and higher degrees of no longer an I it relationship, but where it becomes oh wait you're like me yeah it's a we now and okay. so that's what's really you know it to describe the essence of the group or the relationship as a we yeah um, you have to really under, give a good account of what is the I and get familiar with that, um, even though in a lot of ways in, in the human ex experience, we actually kind of already have that concept of we and then only, and then, and then you develop that the Beautiful. sense of I as, as separate, right? Okay. But, but my point is that the word ethnos um, means, I, I wanna use it as to mean um, 
the social group itself, mm. whether it's a relationship of two people or whether it's the whole the whole society. And, and there's an important distinction to say that like, to show how um, in the, in an theory of sociality or relating uh, the sort of equal dimension of relationship uh, between two, two like uh, beings that are kind of pre-given to collaborate together, right? Whether it's mother right. and child or okay. whatever it may be. Um, 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 so, so that this group is, um, how would I say this? Uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I think I lost my train of thought there. Um, but yeah, go ahead. So yeah, so this is great. And, and this is a couple of points. So yeah, I think that the relationship between uh, uh, human psychology and anthropology is unbelievably underdeveloped. Right. <laughs> I mean, they're just unbelievably like separate. I've, I've taken a couple of anthropo, I mean, I've studied some anthropology, yeah. but it's tragic that anthropologists yeah. and, hu and human psychologists don't relate to it. Right. 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 Okay. Um, so that's one just disciplinary. Hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, kind of like anthropology and sociology, although those systems have been, of course, much more intertwined, although they yeah. compete. Okay. So that's yeah. one point. Two, second point, definitely in my language system, as I use the TOK to carve out my metaphysics. Okay. I identified three different things. And I think, you know, certainly I've talked about this around this topic. So there's little c animal culture. Okay. Mm -hmm. The yeah. four language animal mm -hmm. culture. Um, and you can see this in all the social mammals that are relatively right. well developed. Carl Safin has got a good book, uh, Beyond Words. I always mm -hmm. wish he would have titled it The Four Words, but he was basically trying to say, hey, animals have all this yeah. relation. Yeah. Uh, and he documents wolves and killer whales and uh, elephants. And of course, you could throw in the great apes and, and do all this. But you could see that A, they have, you know, personality, each of the mm -hmm. individuals has a particular individual difference tendency. There are then these behavioral patterns that set the character, the ethos or ethnos of the mm -hmm. group, okay, mm -hmm. that are then defined yeah. by the practices and characters of each of yeah. these groups. And then right. a very one pod of killer whales look quite different than another yep. pod of yep. killer whales, yep. right? Exactly, yeah. Crystal clear, and that is that has emerged through the behavioral practices mm -hmm. and individual differences of mm -hmm. the characters as they interact with, act on, and feedback into a self-other relational right. space. Right. right? Okay. Yeah. And 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 basically, um, like what you just said is one uh, ethnos or or different versions of that word or whatever. It meant it. It could mean anything from a herd of animals to um, to a tribe or to a people or to a nation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, it kind of, it's not a human, uh, mm -hmm. it's absolutely not just a human word, um, but it, it, and it's really just a, a multiple working, working together. And it's, and it's importantly different than a mere aggregate of like things, if yes. that makes sense. Because, nope, nope. The, the, because that's the beginning of pre-social behavior. So, so think of like a, a uh, like a, den of snakes or something mm -hmm. right you know it, it's kind of hard to say whether or not that's a group you know to what mm -hmm. extent they are okay. slithering together whether or not they're against each other or whether they're yep. working together but this is my sort of um beginning principle of how i kind of uh show the doorway to this space of the cultural or the mm -hmm. social or whatever yeah which is i do it through an a, an analysis of uh the, the phenomenology of art practices and how the different principles of the arts reveal a certain principle about a human universal, if that makes sense. Mm, of course. So, yeah. uh, and, and so with the performing arts or the embodied arts, there are certain ones that are fundamentally about the art of not affecting or shaping some physical thing, but affecting and shaping, having an effect on one another. Mm. So in theater, in dance, in music. But what I've also studied a lot is the relationship between the dance arts or the practice mm -hmm. of dance and the martial arts. Mm -hmm. and, and in a lot of cultures, traditional cultures, the practices themselves are intertwined. So one mm -hmm. thing I, I've, I've 
studied a bit is, is uh, the Brazilian martial art capoeira, okay. um, which is sort of like a dance uh, fight game, huh. you know? So, oh, but what it does is sh kind of show you this sort of archetypal dimension of what sociality is in the first place, that there's these two forces, which is the sort of what I would call like the asocial, pre-social yeah. energy okay. that is more fundamental and prior, which is uh, me against you yep. and, and the struggle, right? Which is the, the experience of predator and prey, pre right. you know, in reverse, or a competing person we're trying to get the same food or something like that. But then the, the fight turns into the dance once my bodily action is now coordinated with. So now it's, a, it's the move from the being against to the being with. Totally. And so um, that sort of, and so the essence of real sociality or relating to not uh, in, a, in that, in this way yep. is really like, you have to, you have to get harm, a harmony of bodily movement, which is just what you'd call dance, right? Yeah. Totally. And then from Love there, within that sphere of the dance social space, yep. um, which is also related to sexuality, right? You need, of course. even though within sexuality, you still have at a base level instances of you know violent sexuality, right? right but then right, these right. other levels of more sophisticated sexuality, of course, is non-violent certainly, but is dance-like, right? Because it, it and the relationship between dance and, and that. But then- And we can flip that around in the sense that the first real relational dyad, or at least unbelievably central, is mother ex offspring. Exactly, right. Right, the right. attachment yep. dance, we call that in clinical mm -hmm. work, we call the attachment dance. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. that gives rise to this, you know, safe yeah. haven, secure base right. that, that we can see completely in right. mammals, you know, all and, the way and up. Exactly. And, and this is especially mother-child is where I would articulate the emergence of what I think accurately we would call the, the heart or the heart center of the psyche. I know that's yes. complicated, but no, where, where it's no longer just the capacity to have a readiness to the shape of the predator or the, sh or to do that, but where you have an attention and an imagination to the interiority of right. something, you know, right. so the feeling you're concerned with the feelings and the needs right. of the, so, the young one. So in the unified theory, this goes from the experiential system, which is the online learning system, okay, yeah. of approach avoid, where you're in the dance and really the competitive dance of the predator predator and right. find mm -hmm. a mate find food avoid predator right. get prey that's basically right. the system yeah. Right? yeah then you climb out of the ocean and you start in fact i'm just doing a blog on this right now and you climb out of the ocean and then being out on land actually requires much more deliberation we see the growth of the brain yeah. in terms of its capacity for planning but still at the alligator level although there's some care it's pretty much <laughs> you know yeah. there's a little bit yeah. more planning but then yeah. you get into mammals and then mm -hmm. you get into this dance, okay? Yep. Yep. Then you get the emergence of what we what I call the relationship system, mm -hmm. okay? And then the relationship system creates the self-other social mm -hmm. space architecture, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. That is, that then goes into the social mammals, all right? Uh, and then I'm gonna argue, I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Tomasello's work, um, but I certainly recommend him. I think so, I think so. Okay. Yeah, let me, in fact, in fact, I'm studying a fair amount of depth his most recent book, uh, Becoming Human, uh, okay. Theory of Ontogeny. Okay, mm, great. So here's what he argues, which I think is very compelling and beautifully aligned with the unified theory, is that we can then follow this evolution of sociality. So we mm -hmm. have mother offspring, and then we have peers, then we get competition, cooperation in a network that feels that has a structural, functional group organization. Right. That's right. different than the den of snakes, right? right. So it's a, it's a baboon troop, that then yeah. have a very complicated relationship yep. Okay? Yep. Right. Uh, over time of alliances and political dynamics and all of that stuff. Yeah. Okay? And Robert Sapolsky can, you know, delineate a lot of that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. But then what happens, and this is the Tomasello argument that I really like, and I didn't fully appreciate it until more recently. So about a, half, a million to a half a million years ago, he argues that there was a hominid line as the hunter gatherer structure took, mm -hmm. took hold the cooperative capacities, pre-linguistic cooperative capacities engaged in a qualitative upgrade. Yeah. Okay. And this is, and he evidences this in terms of the capacity for young kids to engage very quickly, at least in the developmental line relative to like chimpanzees or bonobos, mm -hmm. into a shared attention and intentional space. 
mm -hmm. okay, what he calls we space. Mm -hmm. uh, like we're prepared to have a theory of mind, what you know, what you don't know, and we're prepared to interact with that, test that, and then begin to cultivate that so yeah. we can bring our shared intersubjective, yeah. pre-linguistic mm -hmm. intersubjectivity yeah. and a dance and a music right. and a space right. mm -hmm. way exactly. better exactly. Uh, than chimps can. And yeah. this is actually, and from my vantage point, then just picks up this and says, mm -hmm. hey, this is actually the mental field that's then going to create mm -hmm. symbols so that you can right. share symbols right. quickly. And then that's going to lock in the potential right. for symbolic semantic propositions exactly. and then symbolic semantics propositions. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, what did, oh yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that, I, th I heard you talk about it earlier, but that, it, uh, I think if I understand what you mean by uh, attentional and intentional is this, is this sense in which it's, you know, it seems simple, but it's like the moment to where in a lot of um, basic um, wild navigating life experience of animals, you're kind of trying to not be seen, right? Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're a predator or a prey, you want, you're kind of hiding, but there's a special particularity of once you get into the social realm, all of a sudden your relationship with the world is you want to be seen and you yeah. want to be, and you want to see others in a way that's, uh, and so it creates this like these psychic dynamics of the heart, which are exchanges of love because attention, give me your attention is give me your love in a way, you know, which is, and, but then, and then, so what creates that is then these dynamics of like, um, yeah, the essence of performance and, and, and the not only call and response, but perform and spectation, you know, um, so, but then let me get into, um, so with that dance, which sort of describes a sort of corporeal kinetic okay. base mm -hmm. of all of this yep, good. is, and I've heard you and Jordan Hall, I think, talk about this or mention this is then you get into this really important part of anthropology or fundamental, mm -hmm. anthropology, which is, but also primatology, you know, primatology, which is the movement from dance to, um, how phonic music comes out of that. So, and it starts with the, the calling of the baby, right? Or whatever, uh, uh, and yeah. which is the attention to the sound of, of the breath and the sound of the expression of interiority through the specifics of a kind of sound. And then that only complexifies through group number until you get musical language or musical games, right? Beautiful. And then only My from friend, the complexity- My going to love this. Right. And then from the complexity of the musical game space, then that is what makes possible language, right? And then Dude. that's when you, I think, and if we just follow Aristotle or whatever, then there's that pretty sharp sense of once we were in the space of speech, which is going from an unarticulated, unsymbolic sound Yep. to uh, an articulate, you know, that, that's what I'm interested to talk to you about, which is that's when we really get to this, the philosophy of speech, the right. philosophy of the word or language, which is purely, you know, uniquely human. You know, you can, we can argue about, but the whole, in a way, the whole yeah. package is uniquely human. I mean, there right. are other animals have pieces of this thing. We jam it together, create an open symbolic syntactical system in it. Right. Is well, that's the thing, because even the dance and the music dimensions, you find that in other animals, right? Definitely. And, but, but it's when, but it's the, the language part that is especially distinct, you know, um, but I'm interested, but then, so that's why for me, what I call like, um, I'm not sure exactly what I would call it, whether it's a lexiology or a legiology or something like that is something within the ethnology so mm -hmm. that you can only understand language as being a particular subset of social practices right. or social activity. Right. And so within that, then that's when we have our, um, there's different elements to it, but then the, the diversity of linguistic uh, discursive practices. Of course. And I'm interested to get into, we don't have to get into it now, but mm -hmm. how we untangle this knot of, um, of uh, the relationship between propositional forms of discourse, yep. but then also try to as much as we can, I mean, this is what becomes so hard is because once you get the first written text, well, mm -hmm. like Aristotle or something, then, then okay, here's an example of a human doing propositional discourse, right? Mm -hmm. But we have to kind of use our imaginations to go, well, what's the pre, what's the transition from 
the imagination, but kind of purely poetic. Because mm -hmm. this is the idea is that the first form of speech in a way, because it's musical, we would imagine it to be essentially like spoken poetry. Yeah. And this and um, which you still kind of hear uh, the sound of in certain um, more isolated, you know, indigenous totally. communities or something like that. Um, and then, but then how storytelling comes out of that, but then yeah. also, yeah, what point, how you distinguish between, you know, in, in, in the Greek, uh, line or whatever there's that you know when does mythos become lo the logos yeah. form yeah. All right. of so, speech yeah this, is, yeah. yeah this is a great question love it beautiful okay. and then and it's important because it's only then can you close the loop and actually have a theory of human scientific discursive activity right. one which is the most recent development of language totally. but it has to be based in this like uh, philosophical pre-philosophical mythological yeah. totally uh, are you familiar with uh, Merlin Don Donald's The Origin of the Modern Mind? No. no, no Definitely no, recommend no. that. 1991, that goes, so it's now back fairly. Um, but so he, he nails this quite well, okay? Yeah. So he can trace this. So let's just be clear about where we are and sort of our timeline, okay? Yeah. So 5 million years ago, we're at a place that looks pretty similar to modern day chimps and bonobos, mm -hmm. all right? They're sophisticated, they gave in politics, there's alliances, there's some sense of intention, okay? They hunt together, but not in anywhere near the coordinated stuff. And they definitely don't do anything like beat drums to get a musical rhythm of yeah. the group together. Yeah. Okay, none of that, all right? Mm -hmm. um, fast forward, you know, four million years, okay? We have uh, all the one hand axes, all mm -hmm. right? And weapons and we, and the largely males go out and hunt women, females gather, but they sit, uh, they start to process then about half a million years around fire. Okay. Uh, and so hunting and fire and coordination and the capacity to meet, eat meat and the fulfillment of the um, enrichment of the brain and its potential, of course, it's got to be constrained by the, you know, the birth canal and all that stuff. But yeah. there's this big shift, okay, going on in these tensions. All right. Mm -hmm. um, but, but through that evolutionary process, what is emerging is the shared attention intentional feel, okay? Mm -hmm. And then there's, there's basically all sorts of kind of rhythmic, you know, we have to coordinate together to right, kill a fucking, right. you know, we got yeah. sticks and there's a goddamn mammoth, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah. how the hell are we gonna manage that? Yeah. You know? It's like, yeah. we better have a shared sense of intentionality and a fundamentally yeah. different way of when you go around that way and I'm coming around this way, and we're we're singing or yep. chirping or mm -hmm. doing whatever the hell we are. Yeah. There is a we space mm -hmm. fundamental. We are a unit here. Okay? Right. And that's all before propositional language. Right. In my, in my estimation. Okay. And Tomasello shows that two year olds are doing more shared attention and intention than an adult chimpanzee. Definitely, yeah. they do it faster and quicker. And then you think yeah. about the difference between a two year old and an adult human. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, Jesus, you know, we really know how yeah. to do this shit. Okay. So then what happens is, is then now this entire musical, you know, sort of intuitive, implicit, shared attentional space, which we have to then mm -hmm. live together for long periods of time, yeah. then we'll start getting different kinds of symbolic, what I call broken symbolic communication. Okay? Yeah. And so this is independent words. And then those things essentially with the skilled individuals that, or groups of individuals will afford a form of like poetic communication, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 sort of there will be the capacity for sort of intuitive wisdom that is you know shared, and there will be some symbolic cluster, right? Okay, right. And then the, my argument is that this is all building the massive potential, and we see you know evidence, and this is you know Neanderthals are in this ballpark, the Denovisans mm -hmm. are in this ballpark. And the Homo sapiens, one hundred fifty thousand years ago, in this ballpark. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, which is, uh, you keep going, but um, yeah. And there's this like, um, I mean, a lot of this is not. Uh, it, it can't be really that evidence based in, in, in some way. This particular kind of you know archaeo anthropology or whatever. But um, but it so it is. Let's speculate um, that this there's like this poetic um the the theatrics of the hunt right uh -huh. so that there's the 
representation through the body of pretending to be different animals and telling stories through the body, but then slowly more and more with words and, yep. and painting these sort of pictures, and then, you know, go, go on. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the yeah, the level of specificity, hard, obviously. But I feel like we can box in this and basically say, there's a, all sorts of good reason to believe that there would be this implicit, non-propositional, but then first embodied, shared, mm -hmm. implicit way of moving. I mean, you know, right. you could see it mm -hmm. in the when two-year-olds point, they immediately get that you're yeah. pointing to something, they'll check it yeah. out, okay? Yeah. Um, then you imagine fully adult, uh, you know, hominids that have this capacity mm -hmm. and have to work together to hunt very dangerous things or mm -hmm. gather and know how to move through, through the world, mm -hmm. you know, you, it, but we do not see a lot of artistic expression at 150,000 years ago. I mean, there's mm -hmm. not a lot of data for that, mm -hmm. uh, certainly at this juncture. So when this comes online is a very, I certainly argue, or, you know, I, mean, they, I think the empirical data shows that something happens between 75,000 and 50,000 years ago, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. that's going to create a real accelerating shift in the way humans operate in the world, yeah. at least on the relative geological time scales that we're used to, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I'm gonna then argue, but, but what set the stage for that is to me is Tomasello's work and other work that's gonna point, that does point to this, um, you know, the shared musical embodied relational space, mm -hmm. okay? That's pre-propositional and then would go and would create the would create the shared mind space, the group mm -hmm. shared eth ethnos that's pre-propositional that then allows for a shared propositional space. Yes. Yeah. And then and then it's that shared my what I landed on, you know, yeah. back in the problem of justification. So you don't have if you're poetic, okay, there's no way to get the clause in and justify what the hell you're talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. The argument is, is that there's a intersection between propositional claims that then have, can be factually represented as current states of affairs and shared mind space. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, then these have been axiomatic propositional. That's what a proposition is, it means something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and by occupying this, what I call the positive space of meaning, it also then sets us by, by solidifying the positive space of meaning concretely, what a proposition is. Now, all of a sudden you actually then have an attraction or, or a pull or a dialectic pull of the negative space. Yeah. Okay? So then the negative space is, well, how do you know that the antelope are over there? Right. right? Or maybe we should, we should hunt the gazelle. Okay. Right. Or that mammoth is too dangerous. Yeah. Every one of those is an is ought, you know, mm -hmm. concrete brick now <laughs> yeah. that can then be challenged. And maybe it's not so, maybe it's not true, or maybe it's not the values that we want. Okay? Right. And right. then you have the opening negative space, which I believe that the question, cognitive gadgets of questioning, mm -hmm. why, what, when, are right. relatively simple, efficient uh, cognitive gadgets that then open up the negative space of propositions. Okay? Yeah. And you can yeah. hang out with young kids and they'd be like, why, you know, kids will tip over into three, four. Now all of a sudden, why dad, why, why, why? Yeah. Okay, yeah. now all of a sudden you're like, gotta justify it. It's because we do it, kid. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> That's yeah. just our culture. So, yeah. but the point of it is, is that that is a very reasonable story, okay? Because it fills in all of the, it gets you up to the tipping point. Then it adds this, com so it creates all the combustible potential. Then you add the spark, and then the spark creates the complexity building feedback loop in the question. Yeah, totally. Sarah, I'm going to close one of my windows real quick. Mm -hmm. Nope, I still got the sun in my eye. Okay, that's better. Good. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think, how do you think through, um, In some ways, I want to think about this a little bit more, maybe before I ask or before we, we talk about it. But I, I've been trying to figure out how you um, distinguish between storytelling that's true and not 
Yep. In some ways, it seems like h- however far you go, um, it would always seem to be an indistinguished in that sense, in the sense that it's not like as far as you go, there's always a, would be a reason to speak about something that's real, like what happened last night, how did the hunt go or something like that, or what happened. But then, of course, there's always that space of uh, um, fabrication or, or, totally. or play, you know. Yeah. Um, and so in some ways, I, I don't think there's maybe a sharp distinction there, because even if you're telling a fake story that has nothing to do with reality, that, you know, someone could still ask a question, right, and say, oh, wait, did, uh, you know, did, did the, you're making a story about the buffalo or something like, you know, what happened, what happened or what, or, or something like that. Um, but then, so at what point do you, yeah, I don't know, because I think even er- early on, you would have language as single sound, single word stuff, but then also stories, which is, how do you even define, I mean, the big thing I've been trying to do is, uh, uh, by having a fundamental theory of, of mythology, you know, so mythology is just means something that's some ways it, it meant something that's just uttered or said, but also story, you know, and, and narrative and really, um, especially when you get in the realm of like complex philosophy, even though it's in something that's some semi propositional in some way, it's still, you at least see the heritage of it coming out of the older way of doing philosophy or t- doing metaphysics or something, Absolutely. which was to do mythology to, through symbolic oh, storytelling right um how do you if we're trying to imagine a pre-literate time how do we really describe i don't okay how do you so, define the proposition i guess and right. I, I think of course this is what you focus on so yeah I'm sure you have an answer uh, so right so the the main thing that i want to emphasize is that we're right now where we're talking about we're in the real world of living and dying okay there's a total fusion of is and ought. It's just basically, you know, the proposition is I'm throwing them out there, you're judging them, you're throwing them back, and we are pulling them together. Okay? Mm-hmm. Um, and we have, I argue, the problem of justification it has mm-hmm. three sides to it. Okay? Um, one is side, and then two ought sides, although you can then d- differentiate them. So the question mm-hmm. of there's the problem of some degree of correspondence accuracy. Are the gazelle mm-hmm. over there? Have they been there in the past? Will they be there in the future? These are accuracy kinds of problems, mm-hmm. okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, that we're gonna just pragmatically, it matters whether it's accurate or not, mm-hmm. okay? Yeah. Uh, and that's gonna matter over time and at what level of precision and blah, blah, blah. So you got the problem right. of accuracy. And there's some sort of fundamental, um, because I'm also interested in how that initial basis of the combative, right? Mm-hmm. Is there, oh, it is imp- uh, com- condensed into any sort of even within the social, there's still tension. There's oh, still God, difference. Yeah. And so within language, there's that same uh, right. combative thing. So in a way, there's a sense of the proposition or just the string of language yep. that is given. There's already a dynamic of just as in a, any kind of gesture would be given um, that there's a potential to negate it in any totally. way by either That's- hitting them or, or, or no or whatever that is sure but that is essential to the discursive practice of yes no challenging yep. i think what you're talking about with the justification right right well and, so all yeah all so the, that's why it's super crucial to delineate what's the before propositional network of what's going on because mm-hmm. then the propositional systems all get dropped into the real world network of what's going on <laughs> yeah, yeah and what are all the things that allow that in pre-existing? And all of that architecture is still in place. Okay. Yeah. So for me, that architecture then, uh, Thomas Stella is filling in a few details, but there's the, and we've already covered, you know, a significant part of it. You have the basic behavioral investment system that's the animal environment. Then it's a mm-hmm. social animal animal environment. And then mm-hmm. there's a real intersubjective mind link up that's non verbal mm-hmm. that then's laying the groundwork mm-hmm. for a lot of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And certainly, yeah. there's dominant submissive symbols that are like, and I have the whole influence matrix which then maps the processes by which this unfolds. The fourth branch on the tree is like, okay, this is the architecture of the social dynamic matrix. This is pre propositional 
That's framing mm -hmm. and constraining the dynamic investment and influence interaction. Okay, that's coordinating. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's there. And then the problem of justification has these elements. So the one was this truth element or accuracy element. Okay, but then mm -hmm. maybe you were speaking to this other element, which is the other element is the what I call the personal and social interest element. Okay, so and this is I have I want if I'm going to make a justification. All right, just mm -hmm. like I'm going to make any symbol. I'm investing in that to create some sort of consequence and that's going to be embedded in my interest. Right. Right? right. Now all of a sudden that then if we're involved in a shared attention intention, okay, mm -hmm. that's going to be then an offering to you at some level. And to the mm -hmm. extent that we have shared interest in we space, you will take that and we'll dance together. Right. Yeah. 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 But or and you have your own personal interest position in the world and I, just in an evolutionary yeah. sense, right? Yeah. And those will not correspond 100% to mine. There'll be overlap right. and right. then de mm -hmm. deviation, okay? Yep. yep. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to draw attention, make an is ought claim with my propositions and, okay? And the argument, this is why every, my argument in the real world is every proposition is a justification in the sense yeah. that I'm gonna get you to pay attention to it. <laughs> And I'm going right, to want you to right. love me and say, hey, right. or you could slap it away and say, we don't need to talk about that bullshit. No matter what it is, you can just take the right. whole thing and swipe right. it away and be like, I'm going to have us focus on this piece of information. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which is kind of what, in a sense, it's a theory of uh, rhetoric, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that, and so anyway, the point of it is, is I don't fit, because then we can get later down the road to like much more formal epistemologies. In fact, that's mm -hmm. what I think Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle do in at least the Western tradition is like th there's the explosion from Pythagoras and mathematics into what I would call formal epistemology. And that's a big yeah. deal. Right yeah. now, it's all sociopromatic, informal, at least, yeah. you know. And there will be initially, there'll be local, but there's nothing to stop that from going then into the narrative and the mythic, right? It's right. like, then right. why? Right. Why do the gods want us to do this? Why exactly. are we in nature? Yeah. And then um, it's the only difference then is just the matter of the topic of speech and how far you get into it right and totally. there's not real that's the only difference that between you know talking about you know whether or not there's clouds in the sky and talking about you know god or something right so anyway so um what was gonna say yeah something else i want to try to drop in here is um is sorry i got this sun in my face um um is this you know in, in anthropology in a lot of the cultural i think the theorists that i've been most interested in that try to develop a, a general uh cultural theory of culture or whatever is this theme of one uh culture as game mm -hmm. and culture as theater right so this okay. this ties into what we we're just talking about with the, with the yeah. dance and the music stuff but part of that means is close to what I think you were striking on. Let me see if I can shift. Sure, sure, sure. Um, um, uh, is, is this um, process of, um, it's like if the individual is the actor, then one way to think about culture is the context of the play, right? So the individual has their role to play, but the the whole, the system is sort of the field of possibility where it is the limitating factor of activity or what you can say, you know, mm -hmm. but then also the space of what you can say and what the rules are, are shaped by your practice of it. And this mm -hmm. becomes really important in terms of um uh the power analysis of sociology or of any sort of social interaction which is in any sort of game there's also so if we're talking in a game language there's a sort of like rules yep. right or yep. what i would say the nomos right the laws okay. the, the the of the, of what is uh, what is allowed and what is the ought right yes. uh is, and what is good behavior and what's bad behavior in the language of theater, it has to do more with um, the, I don't know, the, the story in the sense yeah, of absolutely. how does the individual story 
shaped and is shaped by the story of the whole, if that makes oh. sense. So, oh, yeah. um, you know, but, but ultimately what we're trying to get at is something is the fusion of that. So it's almost like a theater game kind of thing. Um, and that brings in like, um, yeah, that was always a theme of like Victor Turner, Mm -hmm. uh, performance, anthrop uh, anthropology of performance, and, uh, but then also like um, uh, Pierre Bourdieu uh, yeah. practice theory, and this yeah. sort of, um, that there's the, the categories of different kinds of activities is one thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then there's the description of the process of how, um, with Bourdieu, there's the importance of relating the practice and character or habitus but yep. then the field of possible actions and how you shape those fields. And then we can kind of get into like Foucault and Deleuze in this process of the sort of political um, slash the, the intermixing of the political and the ideology, ideological sure. and, and shaping the cultural yep. space itself, right? Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is an yeah. artistic process as well. You know, yeah. so that's kind of messy, but. Right, and I think that, that the idea uh, the you know what I'm offering in relation is it's is that as anthropology sociology and, and all that intersection is like mm -hmm. trying to make sense out of the human mm -hmm. okay what is the grounds what are, what are what are the parts okay that we're going to be able to grab a hold of and then apply those parts to make sense of how things grow in the last 50,000 years right. into right. all these macro level contexts you know, right. especially after agriculture and civilization the whole thing takes right. Right? right. And then, you know, and then to my way of thinking, that's those social sciences should look down on psychology, just like I would look down on neuroscience and biology and basically mm -hmm. like, hey, guys, hand me what I can use so that I can make sense yeah. out of the, you know, uh, and then the answer is good luck grabbing yeah. the bag of psychology and actually, you know, doing anything with it from, yeah. you know, so you have to basically be on your own. So then now what I can say or what this relationship between what human psychology can now say is actually, all right, guys, what's happening at the primate level is this influence matrix, okay, that we have, we create this infl pre-verbal influence matrix of we space, okay, mm -hmm. that then creates mm -hmm. this really high level primate shared intentional attention, mm -hmm. whatever, and then that created the space opportunity for the mm -hmm. problem of just for justification mm -hmm. propositions and the problem of justification. Right. Okay? right. Mm -hmm. So now what we will say is, is that what that then becomes a f individual and dyadic fractal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of investment, influence and justification that then yeah. will be placed in a wide variety of different contexts and then will spring forth right. the dynamic relationships at the macro. At least right. that's the invitation. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yeah. And, and then you can say, well, okay, yeah, the games, right? We yes. can play, yes. you know, now we can put it in A, we'll take Wittgenstein, we'll say language game, the philosophy yep. of language. Well, language games and justification systems are pretty, a justification yeah. system is an intersection of grammar and basically, and you plus it, you add investment and influence in that. And you're like, right. oh, you have all the contextual right. motivational language that then frames the rules and then contextualizes right. what people are trying to do. Right. You take bring in Carson, you're like, well, there's finite games that they're clearly well defined. And then there's the process of living. And then right. as you get in the process of living, you're like, what is the narrative arc of the identity of the story? And now right. all of a sudden you're playing out mythic, poetic yep. identity functions. Exactly. Right. Yep. And you're sure like, oh, okay, you know, now mm -hmm. we can actually tangle and we can mm -hmm. then think about the socio-historical structures of each of these groups, how they're defined past and present in relationship to other groups? Right. What is the biophysiological ecology that constrains these? And then what are the technologies and narratives that evolve out of them? And how does that create, you know, the potentials that they unfold into? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, awesome. So w something I heard you say with in that talk with um, uh, the sociologist guy mm -hmm. um, from India is, um, I don't know, like, like, as if you, you were saying, like, there's, you cap yourself at, at psychology, and you're waiting to talk to sociologists and anthropologists to sort of expand or finish that part, which is important, which is very important for the mobilization of everything else into some sort of politically functional, socially, I would call ethnopoetic uh, function of uh, language of lexiopoiesis or mythopoiesis, right? And, um, and right, so 
but what so my question is what do you think is what is what do you feel like is that uh leftover that remainder for yourself because for me i it's hard for me to find that you know for you you know you know yeah, what i mean so yeah, I think the like main, is it about history and big macro systems? Um, it's more about technology, basically. Mm. Okay, the evolution of technology, uh, like really. So there's a lot of wisdom, I think, in Marshall McLuhan. I can't mm -hmm. really read him. <laughs> you know, I have to read other people. What do people say mm -hmm. about him? All yeah. right, um, but it's sort of the bridge between okay, the right with the tree of knowledge. You know, it is the natural history. I mean, it, and you know, the justifications cups don't intersect with justifications. Now yeah. they do at the level of as we build them. Then, they, but it doesn't matter what I. What we yeah. do, this argument does not pertain to any of the material environment around us. Okay. Yeah. However, if we do machine learning that is tracking propositions and then starts to build big data sets about what it is, and then we're going to use that to then inform ourselves. Now all of a sudden we are interacting with the informational interface of the data, yeah. digital yeah. virtual world, okay? Yeah. And yeah. that actually, that informational interface is now happening, that the stage is set for that to happen in an explosively weird right. way. Right, right. This is right. the fifth joint point. I mean, this is like, mm -hmm. okay, so now material culture has its own information processing communication language infrastructure <laughs> that now will interface with our language, with our justification systems and yeah. everything else, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the, 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 both the joy, the beauty, the potential of the 21st century. And it's a horrible danger too, because we're now fusing shit in a totally different way. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, I've been very concerned about the same issue. I'm still not sure exactly how to relate to it. You know, I mean, this is kind of the issue of artificial intelligence and the machine or whatever. And I think for me, you know, this is a big theme for Heidegger. Yeah. And it was, a uh, for me, I'm a Tolkien um, fan. So for him, that was kind of an essential issue for modern, the problem modernity, right? The, this uh, industrial process. Yep. And I think it's a big question and, and a critical question to what extent we offer agency to the things we are creating and whether or not we give it mind and i'm and i'll be i'll be transparent in the sense that i think i've always leaned towards like don't that's a that's an idolatrous uh mistake and a very devastating one when we start to one create an anthropology off the metaphor of us as machines but then to kind of believe that these things will be equivalent to us or something like that um i've been trying to be a bit more open-minded in terms of like um you know, there, you know, maybe, yeah, maybe we can create a machine that become the breath of spirit, you know, enters into or something like that. Um, but in some ways, it's, yeah, I'm curious about this, to what extent we uh, conceptually or ontologically really make an equivalence or a comparison of intelligence or mind or language to these systems of machines that we're creating and what we understand what we're doing, um, which is, um, yeah, a, a very a difficult problem to try to sort through. Yeah, but, I mean, they, but, yeah. I mean oh, the, yeah. here's how the tree of knowledge uh, orients us at least, okay? I mean, the first branch here. So the tree yeah. of knowledge, uh, as I like to say, six, sometime between six weeks and six months after I drew out the diagram in 1997, Mm -hmm. okay? And I was wrestling with what the hell these four, I mean, I just, you know, stone, I did the little four things and then I, then I was like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. And then what are these things? Mm -hmm. Like, what the hell is matter, life, mind, and culture? I didn't actually know. It was embedded in yeah. the diagram, but I didn't really know. Okay. Yeah. And then over a fairly short period of time, although I kept deepening sort of the ontological claims about what these things actually represent, and there's still stuff to be filled in. But when you get to the ontological core that shows, okay, what's the parallelism following matter between life, mind, and culture, okay? And then how can you connect that into the processes in the world? Um, uh, it, at, at the similarity, what makes them all alike is quite simple, basically. Mm -hmm. There's an inside the unit, like a cell, there's information processing, mm -hmm. okay? So you get DNA, RNA, the way they make proteins, the way that fills, there's a membrane Mm -hmm. Then there's a sensory system on the outside of the mm -hmm. membrane that mm -hmm. detects forms and sends out signals. Yeah. And it's an information processing unit. And then it sends out signals to communicate with other cells. 
Yeah. Okay. So you get cell cell communication with information processing within. Yeah. Right. And now all of a sudden you have a complex adaptive landscape that's then yeah. mediated by these functional forms mm -hmm. that are processed inside and communicated between. And that's fundamentally different mm -hmm. than, yeah. the, than the physical information network that you just see in material dimension. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I, I want to use this to kind of ask maybe a bigger question, but for, I'll make this one comment is, I think I was really um, trying to get into this question with uh, studying like second or order cybernetics stuff sure. mm -hmm. and, um, and whether or not, and it seemed to me like Francisco Varela and, and Maturana, like yep. to me, at least I read that as making a distinction between the autopoietic machines that we are and that organisms are and the allopoietic machines that we create as being something totally. different. Um, yeah. But I guess maybe, I think that this question is a little too hard for us or me at least to, to sort of sort through right now, but I, I'm interested in maybe a bigger question, which is uh, what, how do you figure the relationship between the material or the physical and the mental or mind? Um, and because in some ways your models seem to describe it in terms of the basis of things is quantum materiality or something like that, and then from that we 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 build up a um, an emergent almost like an emergent property or, or an emergent Definitely. phenomenon of mind, um, which is sort of a physicalist or materialist um, ontology, right? Where I um, I, I'm curious what you think about this, but I, I, I'm more of a, an idealist in the sense that I mm -hmm. feel like experience in mind is prior to physicality. Um, okay. So there's is, a couple of, yeah, no, right. this is a, let's, we, maybe we should just have a whole nother conversation on this, but I'll, I can, yeah. I'll yeah. plant my seeds and then we, and, and what I, how I make sense out of this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's the whole issue. I think we got to divide this in a couple of different places. There's the metaphysics of our theory of knowledge. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's like, if we're going to know anything, we have to have a context for what we know. And in some yeah. ways, that's going to be a foundational framing for everything mm -hmm. else to spring off of that we can say we know. Yeah. And in that way, there's an idealist element to the way I think about it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay? right, right. So that everything is in that container. Right. 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 But then there is, I do adopt a naturalistic ontology. Okay? Right which is basically like, hey, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm open to, uh -huh. uh, but what I really want to get right is that the enlightenment gave us a naturalist view of the world. That's modernism. Right. It's a substance yeah. monist view and it's a yeah. cosmic evolutionary view. Okay. Yeah. So that yeah. clearly first there's the big bang yeah. in an evolutionary ontological natural causation sequence. Yeah. Right? This, they're not mine back there or consciousness or whatever. I, at least I wouldn't know how at all to right. speak about that. Now, the right. idea, the ontological idea of the Big Bang, the ontological idea of it sits in our ideas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But it is also pointing to an ontic reality, the natural yeah. ontic reality that has existed independent of our brains. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I am a tentative transcendent realist. A tentative mm -hmm. transcendent realist means that I believe that science has transcended culture or mm -hmm. justification to create realist maps of the universe mm -hmm. that would that are real at some level. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then my big test for that is that when we encounter alien intelligent life, okay, well um, we can then that, that would be the dream. And then we get to ask them what's their theory of reality. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And my argument is that if they have the Big Bang yeah. and they have the atomic theory of matter, all mm -hmm. right, then we have tr created a transcendent realist picture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, however, they're like, I don't know what that is, but we live in this electromagnetic dark matter space. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then they don't know anything about the rest of it. Then the Kantian argument that are categories of mind that really mm -hmm. then create and that we are grounded in our epistemological phenomenology yeah. that really creates a, an, an inescapable view of realism that's actually embedded in our right. phenomenology. These are, these right. are, 
and until we get another knowledge system that's outside of human knowing, I don't know how we would possibly answer what level of sort of, you know, uh, dependence there is on yeah. our schema for natural ontology right. and how much of that is uh, embedded in our human epistemology. Yeah. Um, although I will argue that I, I follow Roy Bashkar on this. He's a, he's a, you know, excellent. I think his critical realism does a beautiful mm. job. It critiques too much epistemological collapse into a Kantian category of mind view. Yeah. He says, well, that's important. There are the, you know, uh, and, and it really is convincing to me in the sense that when I say I believe they're in the atomic theory of matter, okay, yeah. I actually am not referring to my phenomenology at all. I don't know what mm -hmm. an atom looks like. I mean, I'm still learning right, what a probability right, electron right, cloud right, is, right, but I yeah. believe that that's real. And I have yeah. a deduct, there's the deductive argument. And he talks at the Tina condition, which is there is no uh, other alternative. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's like, yeah. So if you're going to say that the atom atoms exist in my mind, I don't know what that means at all in English. Yeah. So yeah. That's a this lot is, of, uh, no, it's good. Stuff. It's good. Um, I, yeah, I think this is a, this is an, uh, a good thing to talk about. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I think that the sort of platonic and even Aristotelian and um, I'm pretty sure even like Leibniz and Spinoza yeah. and people that are influenced by them. I'm not sure about Kant, but, um, mm -hmm. and I think Hegel as well, um, is that it's not, um, there's a sense of um, that mind um, or as, as noose, right? Uh, which is just the word they'd use for, you know, intelligibility or understanding. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in, in Aristotle's uh, psychology, um, you know, it starts from what looks like psychology um, in terms of a description of the, the relationship between the mind and the body and sensation and motion and things like yep. that. And then, but you get to the realm of the noetic dimension of the psyche, yep. which is sort of like, um, uh, this this sort of deeper inner structures of of mind stuff um but it's kind of this this neoplatonic idea that like um if we and kind of fusing this with a phenomenological exercise which is okay. if we bracket out our belief in the our whatever our conception of the physical world is so bracket yes. out the natural attitude okay. and focus and so we take and it's Cartesian as well. And we take this physical reality that this could be a dream. It could be an illusion. It could be whatever. Right. And we focus just on the description of the experience of it and try yes. to focus on the thing that is experiencing Yes. that there's this description that, that the, the this experience space is sort of like interiority yep. and the physical is the, the experience of exteriority. Totally. And I think with like, uh, Plotinus and Proclus um, mostly um, sort of demonstrate that uh, the experiencing or mind which it gives itself to experience in the form of the finite experience of the embodied consciousness of the psyche is um, sort of like prior or yeah. the same the more prior substance and that the physical realm is doesn't mean it's not real or that the yep. physical is just in the mind it means that the physical space is i mean it's hard to describe what it is yeah. but it's sort of secondary to the realm of ideas if that makes sense and, and and Beautiful. so which is this sense of it is a phenomenal space i mean in some ways it's very much like a like I think if you if you were to ask these uh, you know Neoplatonists like about the simulation theory right that that the allegory of the cave in some ways is it's like a proto simulation theory right mm -hmm. um, but there's this idea that 
uh, mind itself is sort of like closer to God and yeah. that the created or the physical is like this finite play space that is life. Um, but we just, but part of our experience is sort of, we got one foot in the physical, one foot in the, the mental space, yeah. which is sort yeah. of like, and, and, and the idea of emanations is that our, that ultimately all mind, the individual minds uh, are part of a, a single unity yeah. uh, that is sort of prior to that. And then we get into the, 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 the theology of the Trinity and the relationship between the individual psyche, the monad and the whole, Beautiful. and this sort of uh, uh, mystical theology, right? right. So um, yeah, I, I don't know, but so there's still this place of, you can be kind of an idealist and kind of ignore the physical, which is simply just to focus on the the sphere, the celestial realm of ideas yep. or whatever. Yep. Um, but people like Aristotle and people influenced by Aristotle, um, and even you know, there's like in the Timaeus and different stuff. There's a good uh, physical theory um, that there's uh, there's still an element of sometimes we call it the real or the f physical. There's you still need a philosophy and science of the physical. But the important thing, and this is what's important in, for the Aristotelian line, which is really the whole uh, real tradition of like a physical science that in his physics, the, to account for the causation of the physical, I mean, this is probably controversial, but is that ultimately the, the causation of the form of all physical phenomenon is only secondarily caused by other phenomenon within the realm of the physical, but that ultimately the real form of things is pre-given by the logos, which is the mind. And we experience that in the first person experience, and then we just have to apply that to other things. And, and, and so that's, we can do that from us to animals. And but then once we get to plants and what we call the non-living, becomes difficult, but I'm interested in this Leibnizian, Whiteheadian yeah. idea, which is that no, there has to be first person experience and therefore mind and positive action behind all elements of the physical realm. And that yeah. this idea of the whole universe as a kind of organism, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think those are beautiful ideas and, I, and I'm still working my own uh, you know, I have my own frame of reference on these mm -hmm. types of things. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I dropped in. The, so I was pretty much sort of a substance Aristotelian uh, and pretty critical of panpsychism for a long time, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, and, I, and I still don't wouldn't describe myself as a panpsychic, but right. I have certainly been yanked. And I can tell you the story towards a neoplatonic Plotinus uh, form of life through yeah. the universe to the right, cosmos right, right, okay? right. in ways that you know both in terms of my own at moments of transcendent experience okay mm -hmm. and in terms of just seeing the the vibrant tunes of right. the universe right. as it were right, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. all playing a tune mm -hmm. you know and feeling that in a particular way so so yeah. and in fact i developed this whole thing called the i quad coin which i should you know walk you through at some point okay and yeah. the emergence of the garden I mean, the, yeah. this has, um, you talked about the mythopoetic, okay? So what happens to me is, you know, so my story basic, I got to go at 11, 1045 here. So okay. 15 okay. minutes, okay? So, I mean, uh, yeah. So the, the story is I have a feminine and feminist heart. Okay? Mm. So people are suffering. And it's mm -hmm. like, right. my natural inclination is, oh my God, I'll do what I can to help you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm, you know, skilled in talking and thinking about psychological stuff. Yeah, so that's how yeah. I can be a psychological doctor. Okay? Right, right, right. Yeah. And then at the same time, I'm a physicist head, you mm -hmm. know, and was raised in an empiricist modernist, you know, kind of, well, there's, you know, uh, and you don't need to be reduction. You know, I'm not, I've never been a physicalist reductionist because I thought that right, was right. silly, um, basically, yeah. but I've always been a substance monist and a natural uh -huh. cosmic evolutionary frame of reference. Yeah such that yeah. the cosmic consciousness thing has metaphysical problems in it okay yeah 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 um and then you know i then stay within naturalism and then look out 
and you know find the tree of knowledge to be like oh my god we just don't have the right it's not matter versus mm -hmm. mind it's ma material to living to mental to cultural you idiots you know that's right. four different things yeah and you can twist it around and boom and that's mm -hmm. simple and why are people so fucking confused about this i don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's that yeah and then so now i then okay and i can use this and i can organize psychology and start to do my thing okay um yeah. mm -hmm. but a it's amazing to me how that doesn't resonate with the institutional you know what i would now call the blue church it's like it's way more mm. resistant to this idea and unable to see mm. it than I would have ever guessed on the one hand. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And I'm also very clear about sort of that it's actually institutionally anchored to some old and corrupted ideas, but actually needs to feed them in particular ways. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. some of those are soul crushing ideas that are actually now through cognitive dissonance are actually invested in and don't want to let go of. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and then, so then I'm coming back and I'm like, all right, you know, how do I actually help people? And then it evolves from this, there's a scientific frame that does uh, psychotherapy into the scientific humanistic philosophy. Right, okay? right. You know, and that happens like in 2004, all right? Yeah. I mean, 14, mm -hmm. it's like 2014, I'm like, it's like, yes, it, I mean, I already have the outline of it, but it's really coming online. It's this whole way of thinking. Yeah, yeah. That then really clarifies for me. I mean, I had this because I'm a, the therapy side always told me, it's like, well, really, yeah. it's create a mythopoetic context. Who gives a fuck about right. atoms? It's like, right. tell the fucking yeah. story of your life yeah. in a way that actually reduces suffering and gives purpose. You know, that's right. what we're after, yeah. right? Yeah. And then it was like, yes, yeah, so now actually what we really need is a logos at some level of the light of day that is analytic. And we also need to encapsulate that in a mythopoetic understanding. Right, right. Okay? right. Yeah. And the whole experience is framed in that right. way. And that's what a synthetic philosophy would have to speak to. The two right. cultures break precisely because there right. isn't a bridge between logos right. and mythopoetic. Okay? Yeah. Then you open yourself up to mythopoetic. Okay. And then you're like, well, there's a lot of stuff out there. So for example, I come back to Ken Wilber, who I initially mm -hmm. was pretty critical of. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, you know, I still, mm -hmm. I don't buy it, but I can be a lot more empathetic, sympathetic, yeah. and agnostic about it. Okay. Yeah. At least the yeah. spiritual ontology. And once you shift in that regard, that's why you get all these defenses. Because once you shift, then you open up. <laughs> and you're like, oh my God, you know, there's all yeah. this possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I loosen my, you know, uh, modernist rigidity around science. That gets loosened yeah. up. It gets grows yeah. and becomes more fluid in this regard. Yeah. Um, and then a few really key things happen. Okay, uh, I'll share two of them, and then then we'll we'll wrap up and you see if any reflections. So in October of 2017. Um, really two months prior to that, but this is when it happens. I develop what I call the Henrique, I developed this thing called the Henricus equivalency. And then I built off of that called the I quad proof and the mm. path into the garden. Mm. I'd actually developed the garden and then I found this path. Okay? This yeah. is a platonic deductive path yeah. right, from my centered position. So this is basically, I'm not going to situate myself in the universe my embodied experience of being up through my logos and everything I see from my positionality. And yeah. then I encounter the I quad oneness. Okay. I quad mm -hmm. oneness is a symbol, basically like Plotinus. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't really know this, but it's basically yeah. a fundamental symbol of fundamental unity and differentiation in pure yeah. dialectical tension. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Absolutely. Yeah. And then I see that <laughs> I experience it down into my cells and see it through. All right. And I've got this whole deductive path. So that takes me from 80% Aristotle, okay, to now 60% Aristotle. Yeah, and the Neoplatonic yeah. guys are like, hey, we're yeah, here. Yeah, you know, we've yeah. got all these form stuff, you know. Yeah. And then I open up to people like Max Tegmark and his, you know, Neoplatonic mathematical view of the universe yeah, in particular yeah. ways, you know. And I trace that form a particular way. Yeah. And then, uh, like a year later, I'm reading through big history, big history journals and big history, okay, yeah. to big, you know, that's the basic frame. And there's this Russian psychologist, uh, mathematician, I don't know what he is. Um, but anyway, he does a new analysis on the singularity. Mm -hmm. okay? The singularity is, um, you know, Ray Kurzweil makes famous the singularity is near in like 2005. Okay. And for Ray Kurzweil, the singularity is we're going to build <laughs> great. We're going to build human like, you know, artificial intelligence that then supersedes us, becomes our gods. And then you know, Ray Kurzweil's right on the path to the Terminator, you know, at yeah. one level from the critic perspective. But anyway, yeah. he's got this 2045 singularity, okay? And that, by the way, that's totally, this gets back to our conversation. I saw that because the whole point is, is that we're pulling material culture from cups into the internet 
And then we've got whether we create these independent things, we're going to interface with them. That's for damn sure. Okay. Yeah. And their information processing communication means that we're going to totally launch the digital virtual world is going to become a potential world. And the fusion with that and the human world is going to be qualitatively different in the 21st century. That's the yeah. joint point that I saw. Yeah. Okay? yeah. All right. So, so, okay. So then this, this Russian looks at the rate of evolutionary change. He has the data sets from the West. So the data sets from the West are the, you know, people pull all this stuff. And he's like, well, this is when animals come on. Well, this is when life happens. This is animals. And then he creates this singular curve, which is the acceleration of the rate of change between how, when does a new thing come and how long does it take? And it gets faster and faster between the time. The time between big developments gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? Yeah. yeah. And what he does, he does two things. He's like, I have a Russian data set that actually has all these different points. This is a totally different data set of the points. And he realizes that the rate of exchange is, uh, of, of acceleration is not just exponential, but it's hyperbolic on an exponential. So it's mm -hmm. actually, especially on the tail, it's actually mm -hmm. faster than, mm -hmm. than Ray Kurzweil. And Ray Kurzweil missed this. So now you take two data sets. Kurzweil had it. Then this guy is like, I got it. I can map it onto the Western map. And now I have a, a, a Russian Eastern model of two totally different data sets that are now so he uh, places this unbelievably simple mathematical curve or rate of change on the all the big events in the well, not all, but major events in the east, major events in the west, and and then he maps them onto this rate of change curvature. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and guess what? He then has a regression line on the super simple rate of change. So it's like 0.994 on the on the western side and 0.997 on the eastern side. Mm -hmm. And one crosses its singularity means it goes vertical, meaning that paradigmatic shifts are happening essentially all the time, okay? Yeah. Or they've blown into some other totally different kind of change mechanism yeah. at 2027 and the other line crosses at 2029, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so that, 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 I read that and I was like, how the fuck, okay? How the hell from an, from a so now my empiricist science side, which says anchor it into objective observable data, who knows about social change process? We don't have anything in the social sciences that map a curvature of regression in a particular yeah. way and yeah. two data different data sets. And then the idea that it crosses seven years from now, okay, as we're all getting together wondering what the next paradigmatic shift is as digital and virtual intersect and the COVID and the world mm -hmm. wakes up mm -hmm. and all of this other stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, that just pulls my science eyes. Like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe consciousness really is a universal awakening up, you know, process. Yeah. And, and then you drop into a different kind of uh, framework. So that's some of my own experiences with, with being pulled into the Neoplatonic idealism yeah. and other kinds of frames. Well, I think that's the kind of thing is this process of the, the spontaneous self-assembly of things into unities that... Um, yeah, this process. Yeah, this process. And I, I mean, specifically, I'm more. I, I'm a little wary of uh, the role of technology in the future, or whatever. But I'm. What I am looking towards is a different kind of singularity, which I think I've heard you and Jordan uh, Hall talk about, which is something that's parallel to the moment of you know single cell organisms becoming multi cell organisms. That really the meat. What's more. The technology that I'm interested in is, or or is the science of ethnology or whatever, yep. which is the ethnopoietic process of the the creation of a of a society that is integrated in a way that has not happened yet before or, or has not been possible yet. You know, yes. and this is it, this dovetails totally with. Um, just uh, any the spiritual visions of any sort of religious tradition, which totally. is the the formation of um, a society that is uh, an unalienating um, harmonic uh, That's it, man. thing, you know, That's and exactly. and once you get that, because if that doesn't happen, uh, then any then any sort of machine development is quite scary, right? Right. Well, that's, the, and in fact, this is, so John Berbeke in 2014 has got a, a TEDx talk in Toronto, okay, before I knew him at all. And he's mm. talking about the Enlightenment 2.0. And he yeah. argues, so, so about technology, whatever, here's my opinion, at least. You can, you can run the gamut, oh my God, it's disastrous, oh my God, it's hopeful, whatever. Yeah. Bottom line is the wave is happening. 
Mm -hmm. if, if the wave's not going to stop, if it does, it's because we blow ourselves up. I mean, the right, people are going right. to invent stuff. We're already there. We like a, we're, the way I consider us. Okay, is is that right now in six hundred million years ago, basically there were jellyfish wandering around the planet mm -hmm. in the in the water. Okay, mm -hmm. they had distributed neural nets. Okay, mm -hmm. but they didn't have complex active bodies, and they were they so they were still from a TOK perspective, they're not at mind yet. They're right at the base of mind. Yeah. Distributed neural nets, but their complex interactive behavior of the animal as a whole that creates a feedback loop hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. Cambridge explosion happens. And why is it an explosion? Because predator prey, complex active bodies emerge and you mm -hmm. get brains, the new control systems. Right, that's right. The, then you, now you've made the qualitative shift into the world mm -hmm. of uh, active animals. Okay? Right, yeah. And that corresponds to mine. So, so the 20th century was like cosmic jellyfish. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. like we were, you know, we laid down the internet, we built artificial intelligence, right, and started right. interfacing yep. with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, well, how is this going to get solidified in some sort of shared control center? Yeah. Okay. If it's if we punt it over to AI, God help us. That's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. But we're going to interface with it. And then the question is, how does it feed back, and what kind of society does it? feedback us on. Yeah, okay? right, right. And John Berrigan, 2014, is like, well, I think this company was like, well, there's two issues. There's the technology and wisdom. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, and so what the hell is wisdom? It's knowledge informed by values that leads mm -hmm. to, God, to the ultimate virtue of so then shines back. So we right. have our soul fulfillment, right, genuine yeah. connection. Right, right. Right. And that's, and so, but we, what the intellectuals and the priests and priestesses and, and the people that get this need to say, well, God, what is the, what's our understanding and what are the good values that we need to be leading toward right now? And what yeah. we need to do is then we need to have these meta modern, whatever we call them, new wisdoms that inter note where we are, note how to hold the tradition of the ancients okay? yeah. and yeah. upgrade it into the modern meta modern right. world right. that we're in, and then use that to feed our souls and right. seed system so that the next generation can actually then you know, create right. a stable structured society totally. that's the beauty of the or the dream of the fifth joint point and, and yeah that's where, that's yeah where, so i think we're totally in the same absolutely place, so. absolutely all right well all right well on that, on that hopeful we can, note we'll come back and uh, yeah we, you know, we got a lot more to talk about a lot sure. more to talk about maybe we'll do a trialogue with the guy from india at some point yeah definitely definitely so, all right good. Really all right fun. you have a good one I appreciate it. Yeah. Bye.